So actually, before I go into the presentation, I want to talk about two technology trends that's happened in Africa and actually across the world in emerging markets that has influenced where we are today with respect to digital commerce. One is mobile phones, and two is mobile payments. Everybody knows about them. They're ubiquitous everywhere. And I want to share a few insights about why they've gotten to where they are. One is, what is the alternative to a mobile phone in a rural area or in a village, say, in Tanzania or in Uganda? What would be the next best alternative? There's practically none. It might be shouting, right? Communication over distance in a rural area can only be done either through a mobile phone or through yelling loudly. So there really is no alternative, which is why nobody is setting up conferences around the world talking about how do we increase mobile phone penetration, because everybody has a mobile phone, because there's no choice but to have a mobile phone. Okay. Now think about mobile payments, which has now been ubiquitous, at least in East Africa, but across other parts of Africa or other parts of the emerging market world, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, it's almost ubiquitous. And why is that the case? Well, you can pay for things without mobile payments, that's for sure. You can go use cash. But across large distances, it's the next best alternative is getting in a bus with some cash and driving to the village and giving your parents some money. So there is a fundamental convenience factor that is driving this adoption, which is why I don't think you see adoption of e-commerce in Africa right now, because that factor is missing. Right? We don't have, we have a lot of alternatives to e-commerce in Africa. And I'm speaking, actually, I know this is a South Africa specific conference. I've heard a lot about South Africa. I'm speaking more about East Africa, West Africa in this conversation. So for some of you that's relevant, for some of you that's irrelevant. If it is re irrelevant, I apologize. But the discussion is really about, you know, sub-Saharan Africa where you don't have the kind of sophistication around this type of uh, digital transactions that you might have in South Africa. So I, I brought a chart here, which basically goes through, by percentage, what people spend in a month. And I've highlighted for you in yellow what they use, what they use mobile money to pay for. So if you look at the percentages across the board, 90 to 95% of the sub-Saharan African economy has nothing to do with digital. It's all in cash. And we've had mobile money for 10 years. We've had cell phones for 20 years. So it's not like people are rushing to e-commerce, right? They seem to have their problem solved. And if they have their problem solved, what solution are we presenting them? What itch are we scratching? Because pain points are the only points at which you see behavior change in customers. So I don't think these people are seeing pain points. I, I think what they see is convenience. Is it, convenient for, is it more convenient for me to buy in cash or to buy on mobile or digital? Actually, what they're saying with their wallets is it's 10 times more convenient to buy in cash than it is to buy in digital. OK, so if you look at the top cash payments, everything is, is cash, right? These are all cash payment categories. Beauty products, uh, beverages, transport. So what is common across all these things? The cash payment takes place at the point of the transaction. We in, I'm from the United States, so I use a credit card at every point of transaction. But apparently, people in Africa don't really care about that. They have digital. They have mobile. Everything is available to them, even on USSD, but they still choose cash. OK, what do they choose digital for? There are four categories. Airtime, pay TV, home internet, and gambling. What is common across those categories? They don't want to go pay in cash because it's inconvenient for them. Imagine paying your pay TV bill at the office of the pay TV company every month. It's a pain in the butt. You got to go on the bus. You got to go wait in a line. Why not just pay on your mobile? They do. It's clear there's a value proposition for them. That's why they're paying on mobile. So what are the barriers to e-commerce in Africa? So Jumia is now retreating from its big expansion. Why? Why, did, why were they not able to succeed? So my argument and, and what we're trying to do with Azam Pay in Tanzania is exactly what Alistair had mentioned in his, in his, in his uh, point in the previous one of the previous uh, sessions, B2B commerce. B2B commerce presents a very interesting opportunity for digitalization of the, the economy, and it presents an opportunity for the building of an ecosystem around which actual B2C commerce can take place. Now, let's talk about some of the issues that we would face if we tried to do B2C commerce in Tanzania. 
First is smartphone penetration. Everybody talks about smartphone penetration increasing. It is increasing. So I would say in, in Tanzania, it's probably about 35%. But how many of those people actually use smartphones as smartphones? It might be 10. If you go to a smartphone, there, a lot of people buy smartphones for reasons other than using apps. One is status, that they have a Samsung phone. Two is WhatsApp. They want to call without being charged or message without being charged. That's it. I would say 50 to 60 to 70 percent of all smartphone use is limited to those two, two reasons. So if you think that now that there's 35 percent of people using smartphones, oh, there's a big market for e-commerce, these people will download apps and start buying online, absolutely not realistic in these markets, East Africa and West Africa. It's not going to happen because they're not there yet. They're not used to it and it's not comfortable. I remember when I first bought my first product online was a watch. And I remember it was 1999, I bought it online, and I was like, I don't even know if this thing is going to show up at my door. It was $50, and I waited for three days, it showed up, I was like, okay, I can buy online now. But that experience hasn't happened for the vast majority of people in Africa yet. They have never bought and seen something show up, what they saw online, and become comfortable with it. And that issue of trust cannot be overcome overnight. It's a, it's a long behavior change process. So, Smartphone penetration is a problem. Total addressable market. If I want to sell laptops in Tanzania, and let's say I have ThinkPads, there might be a thousand customers for ThinkPads in Tanzania. But what if those customers are in six different, seven different cities across the country? I have to build a logistics network to transport a ThinkPad to seven different cities. What's my margin on that? Probably negative. Because there's no shipping, there's no one you can trust to put that ThinkPad in a box and have it show up. I guarantee you something will show up, but it won't be the ThinkPad that you packed. It'll be somebody else's ThinkPad that's like 10 years old. And then the consumer will never buy from you again. Okay? Last mile delivery and logistics, there, like I said, there are none. So you want to go to the last mile, you have to do it 100% by yourself. And that is an expensive proposition. So to do that on a B2C scale, trying to find those 15 customers across DAR that are going to buy on their cell phone, and then build a logistics network for that, it's too, it's too expensive. It, you're, you're, there's no margin left in the product. You're gonna have to charge 3x, 4x what the market rate is for that product just to get that product to the customer. And the last point is trust, what I talked about before. People, won't, people don't trust. And there's a reason they don't trust, because their trust has been abused time and time again. They've heard about it, and it didn't work out. So if you think about Amazon in Africa, Bezos, only had to worry about the last point. The only thing he had to overcome was trust, the trust that I needed to develop to buy that watch. Everything else was taken care of. If you think about how he started, books. He started with books. Why did he start with books? Because he could collect 40,000 titles on one website. There was no bookstore in anywhere in America that could carry 40,000 titles. So he had a value proposition for a customer that was way better than any brick and mortar bookstore in the country. That's how we started, right? Where is the analogy to that in Africa, right? And it has to be an analogy, because it's not be the same thing. Nobody in Africa is gonna buy books. Nobody cares about reading books in Africa. So you're gonna to have to go back to the drawing board and find something new. So what we thought about was B2B digital commerce. Create a value proposition for a high turnover good for local retailers that digitizes their supply chains first, okay? so. It addresses these points that we were struggling with. Smartphone penetration is not an issue. Why? Because you're talking about shop owners. Shop owners are business people. The smartphone is a business tool, okay? As, as soon as I give them a value proposition on price, I can get you such and such cases of soda at 1,000 shillings discount. They'll do the math in their head and they'll be like, okay, that phone is gonna be paid off in two weeks if I get this price, okay? So you solve the smartphone penetration issue. Total addressable market is not an issue because you're doing fast-moving consumer goods. Fast-moving consumer goods sell all the time. Whether it's raining, whether it's shining, it doesn't matter. People need flour, they need water, they need juice. Whatever it is that they need to consume on a daily basis, they will consume it. If the economy is up, the economy is down. So what you can do now is build a logistics network around everyday transactions that actually happen instead of one-off transactions that might happen 500 kilometers away, 1,500 kilometers away, okay? And then the bottom one being, uh, as in building for trust, that's the key, right? Can you, and, and this is where I think local partnerships absolutely matter. So we partnered, uh, I started this company with the Azam Group. 
Azam Group is one of the biggest FMCG manufacturers in East Africa. And they have a brand that is trusted by 99% of consumers in the country. So if I go to them and say, hey, this is an Azam company, we, we're, we, you've trusted us before, you can trust us again, we're gonna be around here, you're not gonna see us disappear in, in two weeks. Um, they actually do trust. We use that pitch all the time. And the retailers are like, yeah, okay, I know you guys are awesome. So supply chain for smaller, this is like a shop that we sell to. This is the kind of customer that we have. They're definitely not um, high value customers, but that's where 90, 95% of the African economy is. It's coming out of that shop. And so what we can offer them as a value proposition is transparency and pricing. So what they typically get from their suppliers is the, that day's price based on what that guy thinks he can get from him on that day. It's value maximizing at every point. What we can say is we have one price for everybody. So you can take it or leave it, but it's probably better than the one you're gonna get. Uh, one stop shop ordering, we can put all the products, I mean this is typical of any e-commerce company, you can put all the products in one store. Uh, delivery tracking, so we can actually tell them when their products will arrive at what time. This is something that they don't have now. They typically rely on suppliers who will say, yeah, I'm around the corner, I'm two blocks away, just wait another hour and that's a cell phone call, right? So the cell phone is there, but it's not facilitating this business. You gotta build it. Reliability of supply means we try and keep our products in stock because we can use these sophisticated analytic tools and data and stuff to figure out demand planning, all that kind of stuff. So um, the value proposition has to solve the pain point. What are the pain points? These are some of their pain points. So once we build that digital supply chain, then it's, it's easier to then build on top of that digital services and then potentially look at how these points can be uh, stock points for consumer sales. But that's a ways down. Uh, I gotta run through this quickly so I'll go through it. Facilitating trust, okay. This is another problem that's being faced. So again, I talked about mobile, pay, uh, mobile, mobile um, cell phones and mobile money. 80% of revenues for MNO wallets in Tanzania come from cash out fees. Cash out fees basically mean the customer is taking digital money and turning it into physical notes. What does that mean? That means that they're not transacting at the shop digitally. They'd rather pay money to an agent to physically take cash out and use that cash to make the payment at the shop. Which means there's a breakdown in trust between the retailer and the consumer. There needs to be a bridge between how consumers and retailers interact and the payment companies are not building that bridge. They don't care about facilitating trust. They just care that you're transacting. As long as you're moving money from one place to another, they could care less what you're doing with it. They're just taking fees. It's like a toll road. So we have to change that mentality. The mobile payment company has to come into the trust business and that's exactly what Alibaba did. And if you look at the strategy, even Amazon's strategy in India, this is exactly what they're doing. They, they're using the payments as a trust mechanism. So ecosystem approach, what are the main points? Uh, cost effective last mile logistics, you can't just sell a few things to a few people and think that it's gonna work. Uh, critical consumer demand, I don't think B2C commerce will work in Tanzania right now, there's just not enough demand, so why try? Go to the thing that works and the trust facilitation uh, mechanism. So the other last point I'll leave you with is no one size fits all. The idea that you could take the same strategy that I'm doing in Tanzania and then just cut and paste it across all these 35, 40, 50 countries, it's not gonna work. I went to Rwanda uh, three, three months ago or two months ago. Definitely the strategy we're using in Tanzania will not work in Rwanda. And the way you know that is because you gotta find a local partner who actually knows what they're doing in the space. You cannot just open up a shop, put up an app, act, expect people to start uh, buying things online. Uh, 3PL Logistics, I think Logistics has to now become a service. There are a couple of players who are doing this. Um, Copa 360, Lori in Kenya, they're starting to work on this, but it's a long ways off. So you really need the development of 3PL, uh, third party logistics, uh, smartphone penetration has to increase, uh, status of payment platforms, a again, this is a trust issue, risk mitigation, how do you do returns, how do you manage that process? Uh, and the value prop is gonna be e unique for each country that you go into. So you can't think of it as a one-size-fits-all solution. So that's it. And if you have any questions, I could take those. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I just want to know, um, in terms of the landscape of the African e-commerce, how, because it's, it's been stated that it will create a specific amount of jobs in the, in the continent, 
um, do you think that, that the predictions of that is true or is the move of e-commerce mainly to brick and mortar much more of a likely possibility than for e-commerce to just grow as it keeps growing now? No, I think the key to, I think it will create a lot of jobs and I think the key to e-commerce is efficiency. It creates efficiency. So only when e-commerce creates efficiency will you see it explode. But when it does create efficiency and transparency, I think you'll see a tremendous amount of value created by removing middlemen from processes that they currently control. So if you look at even a farmer in an agricultural space, he doesn't have any, he might have visibility of the market, he might even know what the price is, but he doesn't have access to a truck, and the, the middleman plays that role. I, I know the truck driver, I know the stock point. And that limitation of access creates value for the middleman. That value can be given to the farmer, it can be given to the retailer or whoever, but by, by splitting that up and removing these middleman infrastructures, you can, you can see a lot of new businesses come in that would otherwise say, hey, I don't want to start a business because I'm not going to get access to supplies. So there will be a lot of jobs created, but I think that will be from efficiency and, and, and ultimately better customer service. I think uh, I saw a very interesting piece of uh, research done by uh, an American uh, academic which showed that by 2017, 400,000 jobs have been lost in the retail business with shopping malls being closed down, et cetera, et cetera. But over 4, 000, 4, 450,000 jobs have been created by e-commerce just in the warehousing right. business. So I think we shouldn't be worried. And it is something that particularly is, is worrying America and, and, and Europe. I don't think we should be worried that we're going to lose jobs through that. But thank you very much indeed, particularly your, your views on trust. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And also your views on Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you.